Histamine is an important mediator of immediate allergic and inflammatory reactions. But histamine also plays a role in gastric acid secretion as a neurotransmitter. So histamine functions as a neurotransmitter and neuromodulator. Histamine also plays an important role in the chemotaxis of white blood cells, meaning how the blood cells are attracted to an area. So histamine is formed from the amino acid L-histidine and an enzyme called histidine decarboxylase will remove the carboxylic acid, giving us histamine. Immunologic processes like inflammation account for the most important pathophysiologic mechanism of mast cell and basophil histamine release. The degranulation of histamine from the mast cells and basophils requires calcium and energy. So histamine is released by damaged tissues. It causes vasodilation and capillary leakage. And this allows for the plasma immune mediators to enter the area. So like when you get a mosquito bite and it starts to get red and inflamed and itchy, that's because the mosquito has damaged the cells in that area causing histamine to be released in that area. And that causes vasodilation and capillary leakage so that immune mediators can come into the area. They can leave the blood supply and go into the tissue and attempt to correct the problem. Histamine is chemotactic, meaning it attracts other white blood cells to the area. Histamine activates specific cellular receptors on surface membranes, and we know of four types of histamine receptors. In this course, you'll need to know H1 and H2. I won't make you worry about H3 and H4. H1 receptors are found on smooth muscles and endothelium. Endothelium is the lining inside of a blood vessel. And H1 receptors are associated with inflammation, the peripheral H1 receptors. H2 receptors are found on the gastric mucosa, the lining of the stomach, and H2 receptors are associated with histamine as a neurotransmitter stimulating gastric acid secretion. So H3 receptors are also found in the gut and involved in peristalsis, the movement of food through the gut or the gastrointestinal tract. And then there's H4 receptors on white blood cells. But for the medications we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about H1 and H2 blockers. So histamine is a powerful stimulant of sensory nerve endings, especially those that mediate pain and itching. So when the mosquito bites you and it starts to get red and swell up, that swelling is due to white cells coming into the area and attacking whatever the mosquito left behind. And it gets painful and starts to itch because of the histamine being released from the mast cells and basophils in the area. So histamine causes vasodilation and can lower blood pressure, especially in systemic reactions where there's just so much histamine being released that the vasodilation becomes so severe that their blood pressure drops to nothing, and that is a problem. Histamine causes bronchoconstriction because, bron because of bronchial smooth muscle constriction. So people with asthma are especially sensitive to histamine. So histamine can trigger, a, a trigger an asthma attack, and exacerbate an asthma attack. Since there are histamine receptors in, that are, re since there are histamine receptors responsible for gut peristalsis, histamine causes contraction of intestinal smooth muscles. And we'll talk about histamine causing secretion of stomach acid now, these, this is histamine used as a neurotransmitter. Well, some person asked me if I talked about scombroid poisoning, because scombroid poisoning does give you a good idea of the effects of histamine. So scombroid fish poisoning, scombrotoxicism, or scombroid ichthyotoxicosis, it's a food-related illness typically associated with the consumption of fish.
Originally, the illness was associated with scomboidia fish. Those are large, dark meat marine tuna, albacore, and mackerel. The largest vector of this disease is also non-scombroid fish, such as mahi-mahi and amberjack. All right, so what happens in scombroid fish poisoning? Certain type of bacteria will grow on the fish, and this bacteria will synthesize histamine and biologically active amines. And we're going to talk about this again when we talk about the ergot alkaloids. So scombroid toxicity is usually self-limited. That means it goes away on its own, but may cause significant discomfort because of the effects of histamine. The symptoms begin 10 to 30 minutes after ingestion of the fish, which is said to have a characteristic peppery bitter taste. And the symptoms are nonspecific and include any of the following which would be the effects of histamine. Flushing, which is caused by vasodilation. Palpitations, headache, nausea, diarrhea, a sense of anxiety or unease. Prostration, that's just severe exhaustion. Loss of vision, uh, blanching macular erythema, a type of allergic reaction on the skin. Tachycardia, which is fast heart rate. Wheezing, which is usually in asthmatics, and either high or low blood pressure, depending on which side you are on the reflexes. And so this is basic. These are the effects of excessive amounts of histamine. All right. Well, we do not use histamine as a drug. So histamine is used clinically as a provocative pulmonary function test, where we want to see how sensitive an asthmatic is to histamine. So we'll do a pulmonary function test, a test for their lung function, and maybe they'll give them a little bit of histamine to see what their change in lung function is, how much worse their lung function is. That's what a provocative test. Histamine's actions are exactly the opposite of epinephrine. Different receptors and physiologic processes are involved. So remember, epinephrine is the physiologic antagonist of histamine because they have opposite effects, but through different physiologic processes. So that's why when somebody is having an allergic reaction, we'll give them epinephrine to counteract the effects of the histamine. But we do use antihistamines or histamine blockers for all sorts of clinical reasons. And this is probably the most important slide of the histamine series, this right here. The, the H1 antagonists are called antihistamines. The H2 antagonists are called H2 blockers, and they decrease stomach acid production. That H and H2 does not stand for the hydrogen ion of acid. That H stands for histamine. So antihistamines exert their anti-allergy properties by blocking or antagonizing histamine at the H1 receptor, the peripheral H1 receptors. However, many of the other actions of antihistamines really have nothing to do with H1 receptor antagonism, H1 receptor blockade, and that's what makes this complicated. So, Antihistamines, especially the older H1 antagonists, the older antihistamines, can cause sedation, an anxiolytic effect, meaning anti-anxiety. Benadryl diphenhydramine is an antihistamine. It's an H1 antagonist. However, it also has serotonin effects and was considered the original SSRI. So many antihistamines have anxiolytic properties. It's anti-nausea and motion sickness. It's anti-Parkinsonian properties are probably due to its anticholinergic effects. It's anti-Parkinsonian effect. The anti-nausea, motion sickness, anti-Parkinsonian effects are due to the anticholinergic effects. And I say none of these are effects, none of these are effects are due to H1 antagonism. However, we're starting to see that sedation is due to a type of H1 antagonism going on in the central nervous system. So maybe sedation does have something to do with H1 antagonism. However, peripheral H1 antagonism, blocking the H1 receptor out in the body, that's how the H1 receptors get their antihistamine effects. So antihistamines can affect serotonin receptors, antihistamines can affect adrenergic receptors, and these have nothing to do with H1 antagonism. So diphenhydramine is our 
prototypical antihistamine in this course. It has anti-allergy properties, which is due to H1 antagonisms. But it has anti-Parkinsonian effects, which is due to its anti-cholinergic, anti-muscarinic properties. And it also has a sedative effect, which we see has to do with anti, uh, H1 antagonism in the brain. And so we're starting to learn that anti I'm sorry, histamine in the central nervous system has something to do with a person being alert and awake. Hydroxazine is Atarax. It's a type of antihistamine that is excellent for itching, antipruritic. That means to stop itching. And so if somebody's symptoms are very severe itching, hydroxazine, which is Atarax, is a good choice. But something interesting about hydroxazine, Atarax, it's also an excellent anxiolytic. Bonine meclizine is excellent for stopping motion sickness and something called vertigo. Vertigo is the sensation of movement when there's no movement going on. So if I sit in this chair or you sit in your chair and you spin around in a circle and stop, you'll notice the world just keeps spinning after you've stopped. That's called vertigo. Promethazine is based on a D2 antagonist antipsychotic. Some of our anti-nausea drugs were based on antipsychotics. But promethazine, Finnergan, also has H1 antagonism properties. And so you'll see books describe this as an antihistamine. And yet it's used for nausea. If you give somebody Demerol, which is an opioid analgesic, opioid analgesics cause nausea and vomiting, and so we can give them Phenergan along with the Demerol. So you'll see people giving Demerol with Phenergan, and we'll give the Phenergan to prevent nausea and vomiting. However, it also has a sedative effect, and because of its adrenergic effects, it can also cause orthostatic hypotension. So after you give somebody Phenergan, important for them to know that it can make them sleepy and make them lightheaded, when they go from sitting down to standing up. Cyproheptadine is periactin, and it's an H1 blocker, but it also prevents serotonin produc production. So you'll see periactin used for allergy and itching, but you'll also see this antihistamine used for serotonin syndrome, and hopefully we'll get to the point where we can talk about serotonin syndrome. Fortunately, the newer H1 blockers have more selective effect on peripheral H1 blockade and are non-sedating. Allegro, Claritin, Zyrtec, I think Clarinex is a prodrug of Claritin. These are the non-sedating antihistamines. And they're going to have more localized, more selective effect on peripheral H1 blockade. And you're not going to get all that anticholinergic, anti-serotonin, anti-adrenergic effects. Please do not confuse antihistamines, which are H1 blockers, with H2 blockers. H2 blockers are not antihistamines. I don't care what they tell you. All right? H2 blockers are H2 blockers and that's histamine receptor type 2, and they're used to prevent excess stomach acid secretion. Tagamet, Pepsid, Axid, Zantac, they're all H2 blockers, and each one claims to be far superior to the other, and they all work basically the same.